this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at the second generation iPad Mini. It's really more than just the second gen generation. It's a new kind of model. This is the iPad Mini with Retina Display, and we're going to look at it now. So here it is, the iPad Mini that I think a bunch of people were waiting for. When Apple came out with the original iPad Mini without the Retina Display, it was... It was Apple doing what Apple does. They don't ever make a really cheap product, but they sometimes try to make a budget product, and it's kind of halfway there. It's never really inexpensive. It still gets some nice features like a metal casing, but it doesn't get all the top features. And some people really just wanted a smaller iPad, but with all the goodness and all the power of a full-size iPad. This is what the iPad mini with Retina Display gets you right here. Obviously, you get the Retina display first off. You can tell that from the name. But also, you get the Apple A7 CPU with M7 coprocessor. So it's no longer a second-class citizen like the first Mini was. It's stuck with the A5 processor instead of moving up to the same CPUs that the big iPad used, the 9.7-inch standard iPad. You get 2048 by 1536 resolution here. This is actually the same resolution that you get on the big iPad. So you can have even higher pixel density here, 326 ppi. Yes, it is extremely sharp. For those of you who like to read books on your iPad, you will appreciate and notice the difference in sharper text. Now, I had the original iPad Mini, and I liked it a lot, and I'm glad Apple's keeping it around as a more affordable alternative because it's still a very nice product with a very pleasing display, but if you do spend a lot of time reading, you will notice the pixels in the rendering of the text, a little bit of jagginess that's gone here on the Retina model. Also, full HD video, well, it plays at full HD resolution, no downsampling to fit it on the screen. It's going to look better. Photos look gorgeous on this. It's just lovely, lovely looking product from the display experience standpoint. So this starts at $399. It's only $100 less than the full-size iPad. So unless you're super-duper cost-conscious and that $100 makes a difference, probably you should make the decision between the two iPads, the full-size iPad Air and this one, really based on the size device that you want, since you're not saving a whole lot of money. The original iPad Mini without the Retina display and still the A5 Apple CPU is sticking around for $299. That is a good one for budget-conscious shoppers, and you really do still get a nice tablet for the price. It can run 3D games just fine and has a pleasing enough display, like I said. But back to our little Retina friend here. Running iOS 7.03 out of the box, got push an update to 7.04, so the new flat UI is here. Nothing surprising there. You've already seen our iPhone 5S, iPhone 5C, and iPad Air reviews. You know what that's all about, and not to mention our iOS 7 walkthrough. It's available as ever with your choice of 32, 64, or 16 gigs of storage. The base model at 399 gets you 16 gigs of storage. As ever with an iPad, that storage is not expandable. There's no card slot here anywhere. The casing design stays the same as the iPad Mini last generation, and that's a fine thing because this is an all-new design for Apple, and this is a design that influenced the iPad Air, in fact. Really nice, gorgeous light, thin bezels on this very thin product, 12 ounces, so three-quarters of a pound. It's quite light. We have the chamfered edges that look nice here. You can get this in either space gray, which is our model, or you can get it in silver, which has a white face on it. 5-megapixel camera on the back. Power button is up top right there. Pretty much standard Apple stuff right there. Your headphone jack is up here. Volume controls are on the side and your slider that can control either orientation, rotation lock, or silent mode is there. And then the lightning port is on the bottom. And look, my God, finally stereo speakers. Just like the iPad mini, now the iPad Air, you get two speakers instead of one. The front button on this does not have the fingerprint scanner. That's still something that you'll only find on the iPhone 5S. IPS display, so we have wide viewing angles. Obviously, glare is going to factor in, but really gorgeous display. It looks painted on right up there with the top displays. And it, it actually holds up well against the Kindle Fire HDX 8.9, which has an even higher resolution display. Of course, it's also a bigger display, so you're spreading those pixels out. But this certainly holds its own with any tablet on the market now, which is nice. It's not a second-class citizen, again, in terms of specs, in terms of display. If you want this with LTE 4G, which also has 3G, by the way, it's available for every major U.S. carrier, and that adds $130 to the price. So same pricing scheme that Apple always uses, and each storage increment adds $100, too. So if you want to go from the 16 to the 32 gig, that's going to cost you $499. I really do wish Apple would drop the pricing a little bit on those storage increments. It's kind of well, gouging at this point. One thing you do get that's really nice with all new 
iOS based products, it means your iPhone and your iPad, is you can download on the App Store a whole bunch of free applications that turn this into something of a productivity tool. Once upon a time, it was Android for productivity and the iPad for your leisure stuff, for watching videos, for reading books and stuff. But since Apple now gives you iWork, which is pages, keynote, ad, numbers, it means your, your Word, Excel, and PowerPoint compatible products, you even get iMovie on here, GarageBand, and iPhoto, you can actually get some work done on this, and I've had a lot of fun with GarageBand, so let's take a look at that, in fact, so you get an idea of some of the things that you can do with this that are unique to the iPad, for those of you who are still kind of new to the whole tablet experience. So here we have GarageBand. This does not have all the features of GarageBand on the Mac. You know, it's still a mobile OS, so it's a mobilized version, but you can choose between a bunch of instruments. You can compose your own music. If you have something like the iRig HD, you can actually plug in your acoustic or electric guitar if it has an amp in it, plug this right in and actually record and use multi-track editing after the fact. But right now we've got a hard rock guitar selected right here. And See, GarageBand is always fun because no matter what you do, you sound like a genius with it. And there's a whole bunch of instruments over here we can pick from. So that was the smart guitar. So we're going to go with the regular keyboard now, and you get the idea. You can do that. And if you want to use drums, you can set up your own drum studio, too. And then it's got a bunch of synthesizer drums, too. So you kind of need about 19 fingers here, but... It's got drum samplers too, so you can build your own drum track. So you can do an awful lot with this. And then there's the more pedestrian, less exciting thing, but still there's something like the word compatible word processor on here. You know, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time with the on-screen keyboard in this, but with a Bluetooth keyboard, then you're actually good to go. And then for that productivity side here is Pages. Again, that's just a free don download from the App Store. You you get that included with your product. A bunch of different templates you can choose here. Reports, term paper, research paper, whatever it is you want. Just tap on that, it starts you up with the formatting. Portrait orientation, basic set of tools here for formatting, that kind of thing. So you can actually get some work done on this. Like I said, with the Bluetooth keyboard, I'm typing in the on-screen keyboard, well, you know, that, that's not so great. Here's the on-screen keyboard, pretty much the same that we've seen for all iOS 7 devices. And all the staples that you're used to from an iPad are here. You have the Safari web browser. I've also downloaded the Chrome web browser if you'd like to shake it up a little bit. Google apps are available. You can see I have the YouTube app here. I have the Gmail app. Of course, you can do Netflix, Amazon Instant Video for your Prime folks. That's something nice. It's still not available for Android tablets. Only the Kindle and the iPad are getting that for mobile OS tablets. You get iMessages, you have iKeychain integration now, so if you have several iOS devices, you don't have to remember your passwords for every single thing. FaceTime on here. Still 720p front camera, but it has the new enlarged pixel sensor, so you actually get brighter, sharper video, which is nice. The rear has a 5 megapixel camera, pretty much unchanged from the last generation iPad. And now for a look at how sharp the text looks, here we are in facing pages mode. With the screen this size, I personally would prefer just using single page view, but you do have the option of having both. Very nice, very sharp text, pretty neutral white background, not a color cast on there. Easy to read. You can put Kindle on here, you can put Nook on here, you're not just limited to iBooks too. So that's one way that it, it is a little superior, say, to the Kindle Fireliner products, where they pretty much want to lock you into Kindle unless you're good at side loading some things like Nook. Obviously you can't load iBooks because that's iOS only. And if we take a look at it in this orientation, and you can set your font size here and some basic justification, and that's iBooks for you. The iPad mini with retina display has a 7.9 inch display, so we call it 8 inches. And the aspect ratio is 4 by 3. That's different from other tablets that generally have widescreen orientation. It is particularly good for things like looking at web pages. I also like it for books, too. I find the really narrow screen a little bit awkward because I'm just used to this kind of size and orientation, which is a much more like a printed book. But anyway, with web pages, you don't have to do as much scrolling up and down, which is always nice. Really, it's a matter of personal preference. If you're watching video, you're going to get more letterboxing top and bottom, so you're going to get less screen real estate used, and that makes this more comparable to a 7-inch tablet, say, in Android land. Since you have a widescreen orientation, you won't generally see the black borders unless it's anamorphic super widescreen or something like that. HTML5 video is supported, no Adobe Flash. That's pretty much going away from all our mobile platforms now. And we'll play a video so you can see how 
that looks and sounds. The speakers on here are not good. Not really, no. They're kind of tinny. I mean, it's a small tablet, so we don't expect much. But not particularly loud. The iPad Air is actually much louder. Granted, it is bigger, but not that much bigger. Compared to the Kindle Fire with its really awesome Dolby Stereo speakers, this is just meh. We have volume set to about 80% right now. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and we're going to look at one of the more innovative Windows 8 PCs on the market. This is the Sony Vio Flip. We have the 13-inch model, and sure, it looks like a tablet right now, 13.3-inch display, full HD. So notice we have black bars here even on YouTube video, which is widescreen format, too, and this can be even a bit bigger depending, again, if it's a movie that's super widescreen. And now for a little size comparison, here is the Nexus 7 2013 edition, a 7-inch tablet. Obviously a much more tall and narrow form factor, 229 for the Nexus 7. So if you're on a tight budget, this is a, this is a rough call. Unless you're really fond of iOS, for, then obviously you're probably going to want to go with an iPad or maybe just the regular iPad mini that is 299 instead. But anyway, 1920 by 1200 resolution display, so also very sharp, but really we're just giving you a size comparison here. We're not going to do a smackdown now. I have to say I find 7-inch tablets a little bit small, regardless of platform, and I kind of do like 8 inches. It just starts to feel a bit more spacious and immersive, so that's just me. You might be different. You might just prefer the smallest thing you can fit in your pocket or your bag. And here we have it next to the Kindle Fire HDX 8.9. For those of you who've already decided 7 inches is a little small, you want to go a little bigger, but you don't want to go up into the 10 inch space, you can see the size difference. The Kindle Fire HDX is significantly bigger. It does have an even higher resolution display, and since it is widescreen format, it is kind of really nice for watching movies and things that are in 16 by 9 aspect ratio without clipping off so much black bar area here. So here it is next to the iPad Air. So you get the difference in size there. It's pretty obvious. And like I said, you should pick the one that suits you best in terms of not just your budget, but also the things you want to do with it and how comfortable you are carrying around a bigger versus a smaller tablet. I, I really like the iPad mini a lot over the last generation full-size iPad because the full-size iPad was 1.4 pounds and had big bezels. It just was something I found burden to use. But now that they've switched over to the same design that they used on the Mini on the Air, it's a closer call. And they're both very thin and they're both pretty light. The iPad Air is just one pound, so it's a quarter of a pound heavier, but that's fair given how much bigger it is. In terms of benchmarks, it performs very well, just so you, as you would expect. It's a little bit under the iPad Air in terms of numbers, but very, very close. Uh, that's because this is a 1.3 gigahertz A7, just like the iPhone 5S versus 1.4 gigahertz in the bigger iPad. The bigger the product, generally, the more room you have for thermal cooling, so that's why they can put a slightly faster CPU in there. Anyway, super, really super close there, but you can see we are in Geekbench 3. Score for single core 1397, our multi core is 2503. Very respectable. 408 milliseconds for SunSpider JavaScript test, which is right up there with the iPhone 5S and pretty close to the iPad Air as well. And for 3D Mark, the Ice Storm Extreme Test, a very respectable 10,172. That's almost identical to the iPad Air and very fast. This is more than capable of handling any 3D game currently on the market. Infinity Blade 3, Asphalt 8. You get the idea. We're going to test out Asphalt 8 now. So now we're in Asphalt 8. Just a beautiful, beautiful racing game is available for iOS and for Android. Games is ever pretty loud. By the way, the speakers being here, you're going to cover them pretty easily, whether you mean to or not, when using it in landscape mode. So pretty good frame rates, in fact, very smooth frame rates, nice detail, nice splattering on our screen here, very smooth gameplay, it's every bit as fast as your iPad Air, so it should be. So for those of you who are really into the serious 3D games, the iPad with Mini with Retina display would be a better pick than the regular iPad Mini because it has so much more horsepower in terms of CPU and graphics. The tablet has a gig of RAM, dual band Wi-Fi 802.11n with MIMO and Bluetooth. The 4G LTE models have a GPS, otherwise you're looking at Wi-Fi triangulation. Obviously there's an accelerometer built in here and a gyroscope since we're playing a motion-based game right now. 
So that's Asphalt 8 running nice and smooth on the iPad mini with Retina display. Though the camera on the back is only 5 megapixels and we get Apple's typically feature unburdened, shall we say, user interface here for taking pictures. It does take good pictures. You've got to tap to focus right there. We have HDR mode, which we really don't need it in this particular case. Square video. It can take 1080p video with the back. It can take 720p video at the front. But we're going to take a picture of our favorite little bath toy here. And we have basic editing tools. After we take a picture, you can see rotate, enhance, filters, red eye, and crop. And here we're in iPhoto now, which we downloaded for free from the App Store. And there's a whole lot more tools. It's really hard to see, but we've got crop, we've got exposure, we've got color, effects, bazillions of effects. So it's a pretty nice photo editing experience here, and that comes with your iPad mini with Retina display. So you do get some value added here for your higher initial price tag compared to a lot of other competing tablets on the market. So let's turn our toy into vintage. And then we can choose through several different versions of vintage down here on the bottom. You get the idea. And there's more practical tools, tools again like color and exposure, balance, cropping, all that stuff too. Battery life is unchanged from the previous iPad mini despite the faster processor and the higher resolution display. And Apple accomplished that by upping the battery capacity to 23.8 watt per hour. They still say this is good for 10 hours of mixed use on a charge and so far it is easily doing that in a mix of playing videos, reading books, playing music, all the kinds of things that you would actually do with your iPad mini with Retina display. So that's the iPad mini with Retina display. No, it ain't cheap, but yes, it is very nice. Not just gorgeous Retina display, excellent build quality. iOS 7 and the built-in applications are the ones you can download for free. Really turn this not just into a content consumption tool, but a productivity tool too. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.